Hi, Gina. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm all right. Yeah. Good. So we're going to talk about some big emotive words mm -hmm. and what they mean to you and how you feel when you hear them. The first thing I think of when I think of shock is being at a festival in 2019 in a crowd of about 60,000 people and realizing from hearing sniggers and laughter from a group of guys next to me that they'd done something to me. I didn't quite know what it was. And then looking around one of their bodies and seeing him on his phone and seeing him looking at a photo of my crotch that was about four inches away from my crotch, really well taken photograph and realizing that they'd worked together to get photos of my crotch without me knowing. And just an immediate wave of like, that can't, that can't be me. Like that can't be happening. Mm. You, you realize the photograph's been taken. What, what is, how does the shock manifest itself in your body or in you know, words or? I just remember because he had his back to me. So he didn't know I'd seen the photo. And I just remember the first thing I thought was like, I have to move and do something because so many times I've wanted, I've been in a situation like that and I've wanted to do something and I haven't because I've been scared. Mm -hmm. So from behind his back, I sort of reached around, grabbed the phone and just started, just held it up and started yelling about what he'd done. And I was like spitting angry. You've taken a picture of my vagina. Like what is, what is wrong with you? And I was shouting because I was trying to get as many people around me to hear mm -hmm. what he'd done. And he was sort of arguing with me that it was a picture of the stage, which is incredible because I'm looking at it. I was quite brave at first and then I think he was a very big blonde guy and he sort of grabbed me because I had his phone and was shaking me. And um, this girl next to me went, pass me the phone and I passed her the phone. And then he got in her face. And then these two guys just went, run. And she passed me the phone and I just ran like through the crowd, just literally knocking people over. But that, that with the shock, phone. with the phone. And he chased me. I ran into a security guard, like right into him. And he obviously saw me running with this massive guy chasing me. So he, they sort of surrounded me and then they called the police. So then the police separate me and the guy and they look at the photos. They say, I'm really sorry that we have to look at them, but we have to make sure it's you. They look at the photos and then they come back and they say, we've had a look at it. It shows more than you'd want it to show, but it's not a graphic image. If you'd chosen not to wear knickers, we'd be able to do something about it, but you did, so we can't. And I just remember him saying that to me and me being like, what, like what? That, like so, shocked that that was his response. And, and it wasn't his fault. The law wasn't caught up to protect people in this situation. And so he was just regurgitating the information that he knew um, and he wanted to help, but his hands were tied. But I, my first thought was like, what if I was a kid? What if I was like seven or 12? And I'm sure it happens to kids. Well, what do you do then? You tell a kid that because they're wearing knickers, they could like that what? And it, because it wouldn't be an indecent image of a kid because there wouldn't be any graphic on show, quote unquote. So I just remember being incredibly sh shocked and upset about that. So that spurred you on to do all the brilliant work you're doing? Yeah. Perhaps there's a culture of denial sometimes with sexual assault because women feel all sorts of things with relation to it that they can't express the truth. What do you, how do you feel about the upskating incident was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. Like I'd had things happen before. I had been grabbed in bars, had, you know, been shouted at from cars, had a stalking case out against a guy. Couldn't do anything about it. And actually, particularly the, the scene in I Hate Susie and the Policeman comes into the trailer and he doesn't understand social media, mm -hmm. could not have been more literally scripted from my life in that stalking case. We actually have quite a small digital team in the Metropolitan Police. OK, so you're not going to do fucking anything? We will investigate, but we, we do have to focus resources on terrorism and paedophilia. Of course. Of course. You know, unfortunately, we can't afford to prioritise crimes where the victims contribute to their own victimisation. OK. So the skirt on her phone's a bit short. Well, maybe I can help. I bought a nice image to put online. A photo from the set of After Death's bound to get more hits. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> I'll be a zombie. <laughs> That's a crime, man. That's great. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank Can you see me? You know? Oh, sorry. Bye. 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 So when this happened, it was it was the only time I didn't deny what happened to me. I've I've done it every time since, and I can see why women do that because there is no culture that says what happened to you is valid. It's wrong. It wasn't your fault. 
we're, we're too often the other way mm. and there's too much shame around it. Do you think there is a culture of potentially misogynistic denial where men are confronted by something they've done and there's a defensive, I don't, what? 100%, I've seen it a lot. So for example, with the upscaling thing, mm -hmm. I was going on morning shows and big news stations and the constant question was, yeah, but isn't it just a bit of a prank? It's like twanging your bra strap, strap isn't it? It's like a, just a bit of a joke, boys will be boys, all this kind of thing. And that narrative just serves to allow misogyny and sexism and sexual harassment. And it completely eradicates any form of accountability from the men who are doing this. And so when I took the phone off him and screamed about it, no, I'm not doing anything, blah, blah, blah. Because there's an assumption that, well, I'm not a monster. Yeah. I'm not, you know, the very famous Hollywood director and producer we all yeah, attribute yeah, to yeah, this kind yeah. of stuff. I'm not that guy. What I'm doing is just a bit of fun. It's just a bit of fun, but it's not a bit of fun. No. And you don't get to decide if, if it is I do and it's not. But I'm also a very big believer that the community that are dominant in the problem that's happening should be taking it upon themselves to do something. So I love to see men call out their mates when they say something to a, a woman they would never say to a guy. Mm. Even if it's just not cool, mate. Like, even if it's that. I love to see a guy um, sharing a salary with a woman so that she knows, oh, hang on, I'm on half as much as you. As a white woman, I'm, I will call my white friends out and they say something that is racist or casually racist, which is just racist. Mm. I will call people out if they're misogynistic or sexist. That's my job, but it shouldn't, the burden shouldn't always be on the community who are dealing with the oppression to dismantle the thing that they never built. It has to be on the dominant Absolutely. community too. So there's probably the fear of being like, should I talk about this? Because probably it won't be taken seriously. And I don't know, I'm scared of opening my mouth about it because when I've talked about stuff before, nothing's happened. And then I decide to do something small and I go on my phone and there's a photo on my phone of me and my sister that we took at the festival that just happened to have the guys in the background. So I put this photo on social and I said, these guys took photos of my skirt at this festival. The law can't help me, the police couldn't help me, maybe social media can. And it went a tiny bit viral, it got like 2,000 shares or something. And then Facebook, I got a message from Facebook saying they deleted the post because it, it violated community guidelines because me saying the guys had done it was harassment. So it's like- So you talking about guys that had harassed you was harassment? Yeah but them taking photos of my skirt was not. Wow, okay. And then from that social media kind of post and all the subsequent posts I did, I started to kind of build it out because I got so angry. I started to go, okay, I'm gonna do something here. Let's start a petition. Let's talk about this. Do people know this isn't a sexual offense? Mm -hmm. Who, how many people is it happening to? And I started to build that out. And then it, I just got absolutely bashed with abuse from dudes. Grotesque, gross stuff like, guys talking to each other, asking to find, where do we find the photos? I became a meme at one point and guys would just tag their mates in it. I don't want someone to take photos of my crotch without me knowing. Like that, that to some people is hilarious. Like that, and, and framing it as, a, as, a, as if sexual harassment is a compliment. Like, yeah. well, it wouldn't, why would it happen to her? Mm -hmm. Like only attractive women get sexually assaulted. Like there's so much wrong with the culture and the narratives around sexual assault yeah. and sexual harassment. And so that was, I was really scared right before I went into politics because all I was seeing was these guys on social. So at what point did that fear spur you to take action? So I'd done a petition as part of that social media campaign and I was kind of monitoring the comments and stuff because I was collecting stories mm -hmm. of how often this happened. And there was a couple of days where a load of kids, like young girls, talking like actual kids, not teenagers, came into the comment section and signed the petition and sent all these messages saying that their teacher had been upscaling them for years. And they were all terrified. And... What age are these kids? Like seven, 12. So then it's like, oh, okay, actually this is nothing to do with me. Like I, I don't, I have a laptop, I live in London, I'm a, a marketer, I can campaign this. These kids can't do anything, so I have to do this for them now. And that's when it just, I just like kicked up like 50 gears and just yeah. decided to go into politics. And you made, sort of, took it away from you and made it about the bigger Yeah, which picture. made it easier to do. Yeah, of Because course. it was, I was fighting for a lot of other people now, yeah. 
I haven't seen the photo since I saw it on the phone. Mm. It was deleted by the police. But I remember when the campaign, when we the campaign got quite big and it, we were in politics, I remember just having this constant thing of like, what if they release the photos to the public? And I would, for everyone else and for all these kids who had been upskirted, I would only project the narrative that it, there is nothing wrong with the female body and that I didn't choose for it to be seen this way, but I'm not gonna be ashamed of my own body. But that doesn't mean I don't have all the internalized things that everyone else has where I'm like, it was a really gross image and I remember it and my underwear was twisted and I hadn't shaved and like all of those things that you're told by society, like I need to be pristine, even in the parts of me that no one sees. I would still feel really ashamed if they came out now. Do you, have you ever confronted the, the guy that took the photos? No, but I actually recently had a conversation about restorative justice with someone who does that from a law firm about the idea of being in contact with him and asking why he did it and talking it through. The reality is it was such a massive news story, he might not want to. I might try and, and someday I think I might try and meet up with him and have a conversation. Mm. It would be good for both of us. What bargains did you feel you were making when you were actually in Parliament? I mean, that's the whole thing is, is a bar, is a... Oh my gosh, Because yeah. they're going, I don't really understand, I don't do social media, what is upskirting? Yeah. And so you're there as an educator. Mm -hmm. My lawyer, it, there was two of us as campaigners, um, as a team. He was doing it for free for me. Um, I owe him a lot of money. And he was kind of the legal expert on it. We wrote the whole legislation before we went into Parliament. So we went up and down the country and got all the biggest legal authorities to corroborate this solution we'd come up with. So that when we went into Parliament, we weren't saying there's a problem, fix it. We were like, there's a problem, we've already fixed it. Here's the legislation. Everyone who knows anything about law agrees with it mm -hmm. and has signed it off. That made our job a lot easier because we had it there and all they had to do was kind of sign and back it and then you table a bill to change the law, which goes through 12 stages. There was one moment where bargaining was such a massive thing, which was we tabled our first bill and it got to third reading, which is just where they read out like the title. And it goes through 12 stages, like I've said, and it got to third reading and we would sit in the gallery, we would just watch them just so they knew that we weren't letting them just do what they wanted with the bill. So we were on it every stage. And an MP was gonna to object to it in the house and every single party was on board. We'd worked for a year with the government and, with, and in Parliament, across Parliament. And he said, no, I'm, I'm going to object to it. So I found out three days before, and we went down for the reading, and I sat there, and they read it out. And he said, object. The, it, it only takes one MP to object to a bill, and it kills the whole bill. I walked up to him straight after he said no, and said, I'd just like to find out why you objected. Yeah. And he said, which one? Because he's just loads. And I said, the voyeurism act. He said, I haven't read it because he's a 80 plus MP who has been there from the beginning. He doesn't have a role anymore. And he doesn't like the idea that a young woman who's not a politician can come in and get a private member's bill through faster than he's ever been able to get one through. He's tabled 42 and they haven't got through as fast as mine did. And he, and and he, he hates it. But he didn't even read it. No, he just knew of it and just went, nah, doesn't matter, object it. And I'd spent a year getting the public angry about the fact that upskirting wasn't a sexual offence. And so when he objected, the public went, mad, they all got so upset. And then ensued a day where we had to go into the Ministry of Justice and say, the public are really angry. This is happening, this is happening, you need to solve this now. And we tabled the government bill and then it took us a year to see that through. In April, well, February, 2019, we passed it, the Queen signed it off, which is such a funny image to me. <laughs> Just gets a pen signed off. And we changed it and it went through unamended. So the law, as we wrote it, it went through two years later, unchanged. So they didn't get their hands on it. And that was just because of the year of bargaining when it was going through the process, that we just kept it as straightforward and single-minded as it needed to be so that when people needed to use it, it wasn't hard to use. What does the word guilt do to your body or make you think? It's interesting because there's been a lot of conversations throughout the campaign that were like, well, what's gonna happen to these guys? they made one one bad error of judgment and you're going to throw them in prison. We don't put people in prison for one bad, bad error of judgment. Well, we do mm -hmm. if it hurts someone massively. Mm -hmm. And there was a sort of 
worry, I think, from a lot of people that because this wasn't the worst case scenario, sexual harassment and assault is a spectrum, it's a scale. And we always talk about the worst case scenario, as we should, because that's terrifying and that's a massive problem. But we also have to talk about all the things down here that create the culture that gets us to the worst place scenario, like we were talking about before. And there was a lot of conversation around the fact that, well, this is a small act, it's a quick act. You weren't touched, you weren't physically hurt, blah, blah, blah. So how guilty do we want to make these guys feel? And my answer was like, well, I want them to feel proportionately guilty for how it made me feel. Mm. And we can do that if we're clever with the law. When were you angry or angriest? I was angry at every second of the whole campaign. Mm -hmm. I was angry at the beginning that it happened to me. I was angry that the police couldn't help me. Then I was angry that the law couldn't help me. Then I was angry that Facebook censored me. Then I was angry at the men who were telling me it was my fault and that they wanted to hurt me. Then I was angry at the politicians who wouldn't listen. Then I was <laughs> it's like, it didn't stop. Constant. I have every reason to be angry about this. And every woman has a reason to be angry mm. in the world. Mm. And taking that anger and using it as like fuel to push me forward was the best thing because instead of trying to suppress it and then feel guilty for it or shameful for the anger, mm -hmm. it became like nitro. Like it just like pushed me so far and so fast. And it was the reason that, you know, when I heard the stories from these kids and all these women were telling me these stories, I was angry for them as well. So then I'd go right yeah. back up and carry on. And also I think anger is an interesting one, isn't it? Because it's different. Society sees it differently on different people. The kind of media representation is like, you know, victim is taking on the government to change the law. And we're very happy to see someone who looks like me being angry, because it's like, oh, little lady being angry, especially white women. But anger's seen very different on different people by society. And my friends who are black women who are doing exactly the same work are not afforded the same space to be angry. In the rooms, in the media, and there was a real moment where it was like, I wonder if the words that surrounded the photos in the newspapers of me would be as supportive if I was a black woman from below the poverty line in London doing this. Mm -hmm. I'm such an acceptable form of a campaigner. I'm the, you know, I'm what you usually see in magazines. I'm that type of, of girl. I look like that. And so... It's palatable. It's palatable anger. I was palatably... I was, I was someone that could be angry in the media and in these rooms far easier than a lot of my friends are, definitely. So that probably made you angry in itself, of course. Yeah, it did. Yeah, <laughs> more anger. Did, did you have any coping mechanisms for dealing with when the anger was really building? Yes, the anger daily would come from the response that I'd get on social. I got really angry at one point. I, I stopped feeling meek about it and I got really how dare people just keep coming to my life and saying this stuff to me? Like, you can't just send someone you don't know a message saying you want to drag their face over hot glass or like them to be raped by how many people. You can't, you can't do that to people. That's the word, I'm so angry that people feel like that's okay. And I would start replying to them. And then I would start replying to them when I was drunk, which was even worse. And then I just, eventually I started writing the messages and then screenshotting it and deleting it just so I felt like I, I'd formulated this amazing response and it yeah. was out of me. Catharsis of writing it without, without engaging in debate almost. Yes. Yeah. But the, I, I started drinking more than I should have been, you know. To numb it? To, to just, yeah, to create space between that and my life mm -hmm. because there wasn't any space because that just was my life. I was working full time the whole time I was doing the campaign. I was getting up at 5 a.m. doing the campaign, trying to hold down a job. You know, my bosses could see that in work I was working on it. I was running out of work, going to parliament, coming back crying because something had gone wrong. It was just too much. And I, when I had a rare moment where I could go out, I would go out mm, because I just, and I would just drink because I just wanted to, I guess as well nostalgia. I just wanted to feel like that carefree thing I remember feeling in uni where I just yeah. go out for a drink with my girlfriends and just like have the best time. And I just wasn't allowed to have those moments no. for two years. So I definitely drank more, but now, I don't, I haven't drank, well, I don't think a lot of us, maybe some of us in lockdown have drank more, but I actually haven't drank. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I'm, took, I'm glad that you went the healthy path. Oh, That's thank good. you. I took, yeah, I took a break <laughs> from the kind of having a wine to take away the stress and I'd started boxing, shadow boxing Amazing. at home. And it okay. really like gets like all the physical energy out of me and it really helps. Yeah. Feels like a good word just when I hear it because it feels like where I'm at now, 
nothing happened to the guys. That's sad. But I've accepted that because I felt, I feel like we've made such a massive level of change. I feel like I've come to a place where it's like, I know I worked really hard and I know I gave up so much of so many things for years to finish this. And I'm really proud of myself because it was really hard. And, you know, it was so hard I'm going to therapy because it was that hard. Like it was unbearably hard, but I feel like I've accepted that it's okay to have let my case go for the greater good of the problem. And I've accepted myself so much more through doing it because I know I am now more than I ever did at the beginning, mm. for sure. So if there is someone watching that thinks, I want to do what she does, what, would you, what advice would you give? My first piece of advice would be to pick, I think it's the most important thing, to pick something that's part of your life and your story. Because we need a more diverse set of people fighting for things that they are best placed to understand. I was the best person to take this on because I had been upskirted and I dealt with a law that didn't help me. I dealt with the police who couldn't help me. So I was the best in the best position. We often have people who look around and go, oh, this is probably what I want, to, I want to solve that, I want to solve that, I want to solve that. But A, you run out of steam quite quickly if it's not like from your belly. Mm -hmm. Like if you, if you need something, you can't stop doing it. And then finally, just don't listen to anyone when they, it sounds so trite, but it's not like, don't listen to anyone when they say you can't do it because every single meaningful change that has happened in the world from Angela Davis to Eileen Kahn to Greta Thunberg, like all these people, most of them you don't know about who are working every single day to make the world better. The only thing, but the red line that goes between all of them is that none of them listen when people say like, oh, well the process, we can't do that. Our campaign, went around every parliamentary process because the public was so angry they had to just forego processes and get it done. There is no no really because every campaigner has shown that when you come up against a barrier, you just keep knocking and eventually you'll be able to push it down. That's the only way change happens. So don't listen to no's, just get creative and go around them. That would be my advice. Well, I think you are a beacon of hope and inspiration. <laughs> Thank you. And if there are kids watching going, I'd like to change something You've done it. Anyone can do that. I've lost 23 debit cards, but I changed the law. If I can change the law, then I feel like anyone can do yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, you're pretty, pretty wonderful. Thank so you. Thank so you, you for talking to us. Of course.